Hello, Andrew Day. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing? Okay, you excited about another edition of Earthling Unplugged in which we expand on and discuss content in the Earthling, the weekend edition of the Non-Zero Newsletter? I'm super excited. And this was quite the news week, so I imagine we'll be talking about yeah, non-Earthling things too. Yeah, I'm disoriented. There's so much going on. And a lot of it broke kind of after we had put together the Earthling, or at least the plan for the Earthling. But we'll talk about it during this episode. We will. So what, I mean, what is most getting your attention? I mean, did you, for, I heard that uh, Donald Trump apparently paid uh, hush money to a porn star. Did you catch wind of that? I you haven't heard, heard about of, that? No, I haven't well, heard of that one. <laughs> that's probably just my echo chamber talking about that. Um, yeah, why, why, why don't we start with that? I can kind of set it up because, of course, I have heard of it. So, yeah, Trump was convicted on 34 felony counts pertaining to hush money paid to the porn star Stormy Daniels, as you just mentioned, during the 2016 presidential campaign. And his lawyer, Michael Cohen, had made the payment, and Trump was found guilty of falsifying business records by mislabeling reimbursement for the hush money as just standard legal fees. Right. And apparently that would, nor you know, that would normally just be a misdemeanor. And as a misdemeanor, the statute of limitations would have run out. But it was elevated to a felony status because it was the prosecutor said it was in the service of aiding and concealing another crime. And basically that crime was election interference. So Trump was accused of using illegal means, falsifying business records to influence an election by squashing a story that wasn't very flattering. Honestly, the prosecutorial theory and maybe even the election law itself strike me as pretty arcane. Um, maybe we'll get into that. But what do you yeah. think about that? Well, I think in trying to imagine how this will play out, I guess the people who think it'll hurt Trump are saying that independent voters, you know, who just couldn't decide what to do, they'll hear he committed a felony. But I would think that the first thing they'll do if they hear that is look into it. And I think they'll get kind of confused. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, you're right. It just it just sounds pretty tenuous. I mean, mm -hmm. each of the things independently is a misdemeanor. Okay, the, the the falsifying business records and the conspiracy to unlawfully influence an election, both of which are New York state laws. So, by the way, this was not ordered by Joe Biden to undermine. Trump. Those are other cases that were ordered by Joe Biden to undermine Trump. Not this one. Anyway. Uh, and Trump you know, can't pardon himself because of that. If he's elected president, he can't pardon himself in this case. Oh, that's case. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, uh, that would be frustrating. Fortunately, nobody thinks he'll get actual jail time for this. And that's the other reason I'm not sure how big a deal it'll seem like. I mean, you tell people somebody committed a felony, they expect to see them in prison. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, but the thing, so, you got two misdemeanors, and because one was in the service of the other, that becomes a felony. And the other odd thing is apparently the jury, uh, as for the second misdemeanor, conspiracy to unlawfully influence an election, apparently, A, that did not have to be established beyond reasonable doubt, and B, the jurors were allowed to have different ideas as to what exactly was unlawful. I would think there would have been one theory of that mm -hmm. driven home by the prosecutor. But I don't know. Look, I have not paid that much attention to this. I am I am skeptical that it's going to have some kind of huge impact in either direction. Because, I mean, as for Trump supporters getting so outraged that they flock to the polls, I would think if you're going to get that outraged about it, you were already pretty certainly going to get out and vote for Trump. But I don't know. It's, you know, around yeah. the turn of the new year, around, I think during our episode that aired like New Year's Eve or New Year's Day or something, we we bet on the election and I bet a hundred bucks on Biden. You bet a hundred bucks that Trump would win. And my reasoning at the time, even though Trump was already looking like he was probably going to win, is there was some polling showing that if you asked Republicans, Democrats and independents, or maybe it was just Republicans and Democrats, um, how a Trump conviction would affect their voting intentions. Like 20% of Republicans said that they would either reconsider or just flat out withdraw their support uh, for, for Trump. And that seems, I think it was presented at the time as like, oh, 80% of Republicans wouldn't care if he was convicted of a felony. 
But obviously, like to me, the most important part is 20 that, that could sway the election if 20 percent of Republicans actually reconsidered supporting. Well, that Trump would be this. big. But I just I'm just I'm skeptical. Um, and I do think, you know, it's possible that they'll find a way the Trump supporters will to gen up indignation among some Trump voters who weren't going to take the trouble. I mean, they're mm -hmm. pretty good at that. They're pretty good at that, you know, at, at like convincing them that something is, uh, you know, a conspiracy to undermine their basic civil liberties. Uh, well, it definitely but, it, it could bolster his, the perception of him as an outsider and of the system as being rigged. So maybe it helps that narrative. But I think from the average kind of moderate and independent voter who it doesn't really tune in until the election. He just looks like a felon now. Like, I think I think actually it'll work to the extent that this mm. is lawfare designed to, like, hobble his campaign. I mean, for one, even if he's not in prison, just whatever probation or he's on might affect his ability to campaign like fluidly without having to, like, ask permission to leave the state and all this kind of stuff that he needs to do. And it's really expensive. All of these cases that he's a defendant in, um, I could see it. Uh, benefiting Biden in a variety but of this ways. Is also good fun this is also a good fundraiser. Yeah, that's the first you know, thing You probably Trump saw did. the things on Twitter. It's like, help yeah. me out. I'm being persecuted. Send me money. Right. By it's the way, I'm being persecuted. Did, did you, a lot of people watching this don't know, I am being persecuted and they should send me money. They should uh, become paid subscribers of non-zero newsletter. From, and that's really goes into my legal fund to defend yeah. myself against the persecution. Which I'm isn't just prosecution. We're talking... Yeah persecution okay i'm participating in this podcast and i i don't know what you're talking about what's the yeah, right uh, well uh, because you're in league with the uh persecutors of course you'd say that i see um is there really a persecution or do you feel persecuted totally, totally. have i not just in general this? no oh, the foreign policy establishment they're meeting uh, right now they're meeting right now and talking <laughs> about me right they're talking oh, no. about the lead which we'll talk about later, the the the, the lead item in, in this week's uh, newsletter. But yeah, now the Trump, I've mentioned this uh, two newsletters ago. Uh, I wrote this thing and I also discussed it uh, with Danny Besner and, and uh, Derek Davison uh, in a podcast So uh, a week ago. So I don't want to dwell on it, but I do think there are real stakes in Gaza uh, for, uh, about a Trump election. I mean, now we should say there's news just today that that Biden has conveyed some offer to Hamas that supposedly Israel endorses. And by the time this airs, we'll probably know more. Conceivably, the war could end. But I increasingly think that Bibi is just trying to keep this thing alive. First of all, because the longer it goes on, you know, the better shape he's in politically. Uh, and, you know, his opinion numbers have improved uh, mm. over the last month or two. He, it's looking less and less like when the war ends. He's toast, but he'd still like to keep the war alive because he's definitely not going anywhere, I guess, while the war is still going on. But also, I think he wants to keep it alive until Trump is in the White House mm -hmm. uh, because he figures Trump will give him a freer hand. You know, I, I do think, you know, Biden hasn't exactly been a profile of courage, but I think he would fight pretty hard something like the wholesale ethnic cleansing of Gaza. And I don't think Trump would. And uh, in general, I just think Trump, you know, BB says, look, we want to annex it and occupy it. Trump will be like, great, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I do think th the election has, has real stakes, especially assuming the conflict hasn't been resolved uh, by then. Yeah, that seems likely. I mean, I saw that Sheldon Adelson's widow announced some major support for for Trump. So he's going to be getting a lot of Adelson money again this time, maybe even more than last time, because maybe Sheldon being gone means there's more available for him. Um, and then, you know, Nikki Haley is all on board with Trump, and that seems to have a lot to do with yeah. his, you know, quote unquote, support for Israel. Um, so I agree, you know, and the, his track record in his first administration suggests that he would give Netanyahu a freer hand, although they did have some sort of personal tiff uh, at the end of Trump's term. Um, but, but yeah, I think you're right. I don't know if I think he would be worse on other foreign policy issues than Biden. 
you know, worse from our perspective, but on, on Israel, I, th I think so. Um, is there anything else we want to say about the, the conviction? Do you think this is like bad for our republic, our society? Are we going to see oh, an erosion? Of I mean, I think we're in a downward spiral generally. And I, I, I do not, I, 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 I would not have recommended that they bring this case in general. I think if you are going to, especially in a, in as polarized an environment as this one, if you are going to bring a case against the former president, in this kind of atmosphere, you better have the the crime better be clear and intelligible, and mm -hmm. you better have a strong case. This crime is not clear and intelligible. Yeah. Now, of course, again, this is just a district attorney. They're all over the place. Uh, it's not as if Biden ordered this up, but there are several other cases. I'd have to look closely at them to say if I think any of them were a good idea. Um, but you know, this is like when, you know, administrations start prosecuting their rivals. That's not generally a good sign um, if you're and trying to does, avoid becoming banana. This Republican. does seem like the weakest of the cases against Trump. Yeah, so, probably. So when, when they're saying, you know, it proves that no man is above the law, it kind of seems more like that phrase from, the, I think, the Soviet Union, show, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Like, this is what kind of banana republics do is, you know, you can kind of assume that everyone has sort of done something kind of legally tenuous um, and you can target your your opponents. I know that Hillary Clinton had to, or her campaign had to pay the FEC like $110,000 or something for something very similar for misreporting mm -hmm. spending on opposition research, the Steele dossier. Uh, they just presented it or uh, labeled it as as legal fees. It's like very similar to what Trump has done. Of course, she wasn't charged for that. They had to pay a fee, um, but it didn't go to trial or anything. But uh, yeah, um, no, this seemed this seemed like a reach. Uh, so let's see. Now, the Ukraine news in the newsletter. Uh, it's kind of a good news, bad news. Bad news story, I guess. I mean, the, I, I guess the good news is that uh, Putin has reported, Reuters says they have four sources who mm -hmm. would know that saying that Putin is ready to talk peace. I thought he was all along. I mean, I, I think he has been probably for a long time, but it, it's if you're hoping for peace talks, it's good to have it out there. Makes it more likely to happen. Um, and uh, you would think that Ukraine is starting to get into a mood to settle uh, for a cessation of ho hostilities that that uh, wasn't preceded by the full recovery of their territory, because things are getting kind of dicey there. And that's um, that is what the Reuters report said is that he he's Putin is is willing and ready to negotiate a ceasefire along the current battlefield lines, so Russia would retain all the territory that it yeah. currently occupies under this arrangement. Um, and it also said that if the West and Ukraine aren't willing to start these ceasefire negotiations now, he plans to try to take more land to to pressure Kiev to push them to the negotiating table. And it seems like maybe this was, do I mean, you think this was a signal Putin was sending out on purpose or or how do you think that, that goes? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, first of all, of course, a lot of details to be worked out, like, what is, you know, if this was going to be an enduring settlement, what is the security arrangement for Ukraine? You know, it's like, uh, it's, I think, you know, they'd love to be in NATO, but NATO would have trouble admitting a country, part of which is still embroiled in conflict, technically. Mm -hmm. um, and can I, plug, I don't know. Can I plug something on, I, I wrote a piece for National Interest that published this week, where mm -hmm. I talk about this, saying basically that they should... Ukraine should join the EU. That's basically what I say. And Macron should should lead the way because the EU does have this common security framework. They have like a defense arrangement. Sometimes they make exceptions for countries that want to be neutral, but I think they mm -hmm. shouldn't do that in this case. And then the France and whatever other countries agree with this um, should guarantee that Ukraine won't join NATO. I think Macron could guarantee that. Because he has some credibility, his his the opposition is perceived to be more Putin friendly than he is. 
within France. So if he made that guarantee, I think it could stick. Yeah, I don't think Putin cares about the EU the way he used to. I mean, mm -hmm. I think supposedly uh, the deal that supposedly was under discussion very early in the war would have allowed uh, membership in the EU. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know that the security guarantees from the EU would feel very real to Ukraine. But I guess if I guess if anything brought like European troops into Ukraine as a presence, as a kind of a tripwire, that would feel pretty good. I don't know. Um, well, one thing one thing that's weird about Macron in particular is at the beginning he was saying very kind of dovish things, like at the beginning of the full scale invasion. I mean, saying we shouldn't humiliate Putin. And before the invasion started, he was you know a real advocate of of diplomacy. He went and talked to Putin in Moscow. But then he's kind of undergone this evolution where he's become like the leading Russia hawk, like saying we should consider sending NATO troops to Ukraine and military trainers um, and that Germany should send more weapons. I think a lot of that is intended to create this, what he calls strategic ambiguity so that Putin thinks maybe Europe would intervene. I don't know how persuasive, persuasive it is, but he seems to be thinking along those lines. Um, but I guess we could talk about the bad news now the bad Russian well it may be news. related to the good news i mean i'm wondering if the timing of this kind of uh leak about putin's readiness to talk is related to the fact that there was more and more discussion about the west including america permitting the use of their weapons inside russia's border that's now official mm -hmm. at least within limited areas biden is saying yes around kharkiv you can use our weapons to at least strike like artillery and missile launchers that are striking you from across the border. That's new. Putin definitely doesn't like it. He's gone to great pains to signal how unhappy he'd be with it and even to hint that there it could lead to nuclear war. Um, and maybe the prospect of that happening is, is leading him to say, hey, maybe we should start winding this thing up. I don't know. Yeah, yeah that definitely seems... Possible. And, and the timing of, of this is, is all really unfortunate because, you know, another thing that's happening right now is Ukraine basically is pursuing this new military tactic that, as we know, the newsletter could make nuclear war more likely. So in the mm -hmm. past week or so, um, two Ukrainian drones have struck nuclear early warning facilities pretty deep inside Russia. And the primary function of these facilities is to detect incoming nuclear attacks so that Russia can launch a nuclear retaliation before its own nuclear forces are destroyed. That's what is called a second strike capability, and it's important from the standpoint of nuclear deterrence. Um, and in the Earthling, we link to a Twitter thread by this nuclear policy expert, James Acton, um, who makes the case that one, Ukraine derives very little military benefit from these strikes. The radar mm -hmm. at these facilities doesn't look at Ukrainian territory, their southern facing radar, and they're designed to detect intercontinental ballistic missiles from a great distance. Um, and two, Acton says that these strikes raise the risk of nuclear war for a variety of reasons. I mean, if Russia's nuclear warning system is dysfunctional, there could be a false alarm that could lead Russia to launch a nuke. They may think that Ukraine is doing this at our behest because we're like prepping for nuclear war. I mean, Putin's kind of paranoid about NATO and the U.S., so that seems possible. Um, and so, yeah. yeah it, it's right now the White House should be convincing Putin that we had no advance warning of this. We didn't orchestrate it, assuming that's true, that we didn't. And this change in policy that you were just talking about, I think, does the opposite. It makes the Kremlin feel more like this is a war against the collective West, not just Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, the nuclear thing, um, you know, it's weird. Uh, the logic of deterrence that. Uh, you know, both both sides throughout the Cold War, pretty much. Uh, I, I mean, maybe it started partway through the Cold War, but they had this this launch on warning protocol, uh, which means if if you think the nuclear missiles are incoming, you go ahead and launch yours. Uh, and in a way, that seems kind of gratuitous because. If they're launching all of theirs, you're toast in any event. <laughs> Why not let the, the Russians have long and happy lives? They didn't order the strike. But part of the idea is this ensures deterrence. If both sides credibly say we will launch on warning, then neither side will launch 
a first strike. And it mm -hmm. seems to work. The downside is it, it means both sides have very sensitive trigger fingers. That's what they're mm -hmm. claiming, at least. That's what launch on warning is. We may not have time to verify with 100% confidence that this is a nuclear strike, but we are committing uh, to proceed on the basis of strong evidence. And that's why it's it's very dicey to screw around with this shit. You know, the mm -hmm. uh, start striking these radar installations. I think one of them, is it true that one of them is like either 1,100 kilometers or miles inside Russia mm -hmm. and, and Ukraine hit it with a drone? Um, the you know when you think about it, there's a lot of dicey stuff going on in the world. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's these two things going on in Ukraine now. Western weapons striking across the border. Ukraine striking these uh, radar facilities. Now, the good news there is, uh, yesterday the Washington report, uh, uh, the Washington Post reported that uh, Biden has gotten in touch with Ukraine, or the Biden officials have, and said we don't think this is cool. So maybe that'll stop. But meanwhile, uh, in Taiwan, China like encircled Taiwan with ships as a sign of displeasure with whatever the new president, uh, the new independence orient, relatively independence oriented president uh, said uh, at the inaugural. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the Middle East, it's just, you know, it's kind of touch and go. I mean, we've had, it was, a little, little, little scary, the exchange between uh, Israel and Iran. Um, you know, you can't really relax until the shooting stops in Gaza. Uh, I don't remember the last time you had three arenas. I mean, I'm not that worried about Taiwan right now. I think this is all pretty clear-cut signaling. But still, I don't remember a time when there was cause for concern in more than one place. At once. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't seem like during the Cold War there were any proxy wars that were as unnerving as the Ukraine war has turned out to be. I mean, no, where, I mean the Cuban Missile Crisis was was extremely scary. Mm -hmm. There wasn't. I guess war. I wasn't thinking of that as a proxy war. Yeah, that there were moments right. that were very scary. Um, yeah. But we hear about these proxy wars that occurred during the Cold War, but I don't think any of them were like this, where we're like not only giving Ukraine weapons, but helping them with military strategy, helping them with targeting, and now letting them strike on Russian territory. But that seems to go beyond what people think of as a proxy war. Um, and from Russia's perspective, definitely, it just seems like us kind of instrumentalizing Ukraine to fight Russia, um, which I guess is what a proxy war could <laughs> it is. But, but yeah, yeah, it's pretty... The I mean, of course, Russia's been, uh, you know, making gains lately. So they're, they weren't feeling super threatened, maybe until these recent developments. But um, do you think, you know, we were talking a lot about Putin's humiliation at the beginning of this war as motivating uh, the invasion and as something to, to think about, at least, or a lot of people were talking about this, something to think about as we try to push towards a peace deal. Do you think Western humiliation is now? The thing that we need to discuss like they they don't want to negotiate a ceasefire now because it looks kind of terrible like russia's on the offensive ukraine is destroyed it seems like this strategy has totally failed you mean should we worry about like us being not, humiliated not should we worry about it but do you think that's why biden et, et cetera, are kind of unwilling mm -hmm. to pursue the ceasefire at the moment well i think you know they kind of all the talk about total victory, rolling the Russian troops back that you heard for the first year and a half of the war uh, has made it harder, I guess, for him politically. Yeah. But I will say, I think for him politically, it's better to get some kind of cessation of hostilities than for Trump to be able to say, I would have ended this war by now. You've spent X amount of dollars. It's an endless war. To what end? You should have. You should have stopped it. When your own, I doubt Trump will have the presence of mind to say this, but when your own chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said in November of 2022, yeah, mm -hmm. um, that this is as good as it's going to get on the ground, which it turned out to be more or less, that that was the time to cut a deal. You didn't, you didn't have the nerve to pressure Ukraine into it, to use your leverage. Uh, I... I think Biden's I think Biden's better off 
if when the election happens, there's no fighting in Ukraine or Gaza. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, talking about all of these different kind of theaters of Cold War uh, related conflict, maybe as a good segue to your lead item, which is about the, the rules based order and about a kind of missed opportunity that America had um, to go down the path of the rules based order. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we were going to go to the overtime section at this around this time. Um, yeah. So, so I guess, uh, yeah, and I should say, I definitely wouldn't miss the overtime segment because uh, I'm going to do some serious trash talk about David Sanger, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of thing you charge for. I suppose people could go read it in the newsletter, but we shouldn't tell them that. It's better to hear it. Yeah, better to hear I it. Think. You More really, the, my, I bring a lot to the presentation. Just, you know, my <laughs> theatrical training really comes in handy here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and a little uh, complaining about Gideon Rachman, who is the the uh, chief financial Times. policy commentator mm -hmm. for the Financial Times. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But Sanger, I mean, you got to admit, like I caught him in a like a pretty serious, he, uh, if inadvertent, possibly misrepresentation of reality, like embarrassing, like in a just world, would mm -hmm. he be out on the street jobless or what? Yeah, that when you sent me that podcast and asked me to kind of verify that you were hearing it right, I, as I was listening to it, I realized why you had sent it to me because it does seem like he's just he's what just he's saying is not true at all. Yeah, uh, it's very strange. Maybe we could talk about what is it that exact what is it exactly that leads these foreign policy commentators in the blob to to start speaking this way about yeah. these kinds of things that we're going to be discussing. But we're also going to talk about China. Um, this Wall Street Journal article about how the sanctions have kind of pushed all these authoritarian countries that we're sanctioning closer mm. together. And that's why they've been able to kind of weather the sanctions storm. We'll talk about Sam Altman. His bad publicity mm -hmm. has continued. Um, and there's probably something else I'm forgetting. Yeah. And no, uh, I may say a little more about AI more substantively. But yeah. Mm. So anyway. Uh, the way you get access to overtime is to go to the non zero newsletter, become a paid subscriber. You can just click on this very post that represents this podcast. Do it that way. And even set up a feed that'll give you access to all the overtimes if you are a member. And um, thanks in any event for listening, watching. Smash the like button, rate and review. You know, it's a, it is, it's competitive, man. It is. Podcast world. Yeah, we're experiencing a lot of algorithmic su suppression. Yeah, well, it's part of my per the persecution <laughs> I mentioned earlier, I think. <laughs> yeah. Bob's so, algorithm. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thanks, everybody, for listening. So, see you so next time. So, here we go. <laughs> Into overtime. <laughs>